Well, hello everyone. My name is Rob Coburn and I'm the founder of the America's Greatest Awakening Network. And we are all about revival and awakening in America. And we are here today to do another interview about what revival and awakening means to a pastor and a leader. And our view here at the AGA Network is that God moves inside of each of us and that's what revival actually is. We go to events and we love events and we're gonna talk about some events that have gone on where God showed up in an amazing way. Uh, but revival can just be you in your prayer closet. Revival can be you and a small group of people in your home studying the word where Jesus walks into the room and, and changes your life. And so we're here in the studio today and I wanna introduce to you my friend, Pastor Mike DeYoung from Iowa. And, uh, and we got to meet in some cool places, some cool places about an event that you did called Revival at the Field. And it was at the Field of Dreams in Iowa. So welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, Pastor Rob. Appreciate it. So yeah, we uh, got connected here six months ago and it turned out to be a great day. Yeah, amazing time. Uh, we had our crew there. We broadcasted the event on the network and, and helped you out in that way. And man, what, what I loved about the event in an iconic place, number one, the Field of Dreams, um, and uh, and oh, how I wish that many uh, many people would understand the power of the dream that God puts in us, right? And and you had a dream of doing it on the field, uh, but how it really just um, watching it through the lens, uh, it brought this this excitement in me that there are iconic places in America that have been reserved uh, for other things that God is now using. To, to, to see his message brought forth to the world. Yeah, amen, amen, that's exactly what it was. And you know, a lot of people too, like you talk about, you know, revival is not like a, an event, but it's, it's a movement and it's about awakening within ourselves. And for me, that began 16 years ago. Like I, 2006, I mean, I was a prodigal son. So I mean, I wandered, I was in the world. I mean, you name it, I grew up in the church, but from 19 to 26, it was you know, drug abuse, drinking, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I had an encounter with Christ at 26 where, you know, I was turned from sin in the day. I had a sister who loved Jesus and I was born again, brought out of the world, out of the miry, mucky clay and pulled up on a rock. But in one day I was delivered and set free. And that was back in 2006. But it was shortly after that that the Lord gave me the word revival. And I didn't even know what revival was. We began to study, you know, what revival was and studied all the great revivals. But this was in a sense, 16 years in the making. And, you know, we've had, we've lived in, you know, sense of revival personally for many years, but the last three years we've been in a move of God, like I can't explain. And uh, it began right before COVID, but the revival at the field was in a sense, kind of the pinnacle of a three-year move of God within our community, our area, a birthing of a church. Uh, FCA many things so I can go to that side of it too if you'd like me to yeah well I'd love to hear what God has done what he's doing now and what you're seeing in the future that's that's an amazing thing let's talk for a minute about the field I know it was a culmination of revival so maybe you'll get into some of the history of it but um, so you rented this iconic place uh, you, you're mm -hmm. you're at the field of dreams um, and uh, there's movies about it there's a movie about it there's all this stuff um, but what was the driving force inside of you? What what did you hear when you walked on the property? You know, it was about 2010. You know, I had a devotional from a guy by the name of Oz Hillman, and he brought up the movie Fill the Dreams, and when he felt the calling into ministry, you know, that was part of his calling was that movie. And, you know, in the movie, you know, Kevin Costner hears, you know, if, he, if you build it, he will come. And, uh, you know, you can relate to the spiritual side of it, like if you build it, he will come Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Like his presence. And uh, so when we began to visit that field for the first time in 2000, oh, sh probably 15, 16, you know, I sat out there one morning doing devotions and I'm like, we have to do an event here someday. Yeah. And, and uh, we walked in the field to rent it and found out the cost and everything and rented the whole facility. But it was, it was pretty amazing when we walked into the facility on that weekend to rent it and get it set up. It was it was an amazing feeling. I had a friend, Galad. Um, he has a ministry called Radiant Israel. And when he felt his call into the ministry, it was through that movie too. Wow. So it's really interesting. It's like uh, how the Lord can use a movie, you know, from the world in a sense. But I feel like he was behind that movie in a, in a spiritual sense, using the message in it um, to create a movement to restore the hearts of the children of the fathers. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Because that's essentially what it was. You know, you look at Malachi 4, 6, and it says, in the last days, I'll, I'll, I'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, or I'll come and strike the land with a curse. And in a sense, like that movie was, you know, Ray, Kevin Costner, his heart turning back to his father, and the restoration of that relationship, which in a sense, you look at the fatherless issue in America, but then ultimately the, the relationship with the father in heaven is the big need for restoration. But it was amazing. I mean, it was it was life-changing. It was a weekend that I just can't explain. Um, we really seen just a body of people come together that that reflected Christ. And um, we had a friend, Daryl Strawberry, there, which was even more memorable, you know, being a professional baseball player, so it was, it was really special. Yeah, I I remember just seeing and engaging with it, and uh, and how uh, authentic that would be the word that I would say um, authentic the the times were of worship and ministry and and just uh, family seemed like seemed like family was there, and so that that's amazing. So what so from from your earliest turnaround, uh, your, what I would say personal revival, your start, mm-hmm. um, up into up into that time, what has God really ignited in you about leading, about pastoring, about leading revivals and things like that? How, how has that really changed? I know there's a lot of people that watch this that maybe they've been walking with the Lord for a long time, or maybe they haven't, they've been a very short time, but I, I truly believe there's a pattern in how the Lord walks with us if we're willing to walk with Him. So how did He do it with you? Yeah, you know, I think about it too, and I, I always look at you know, the, the life of Jesus and the life of Paul, but, you know, Paul had an encounter. He went from Saul to Paul, the Damascus Road experience, and, you know, he's blinded for three days, and then he goes on, he's a tent maker during the day, preaching, so he's bivocational. But that was our life. Like, we, we came to Christ. I came to Christ, you know, in 2006. I was a business owner, and uh, we... We're in a sense tent makers, but our ministry for 13 years was in the marketplace um, mm-hmm. alongside churches. So we were totally bivocational, just sharing the love of Jesus without a pay, without anything as people in the business world. And that's where it began for 13 years. And we came alongside church leaders, alongside people, and we seen a ton of people come to Christ through our business. So we had a, a networking company that, you know, we had a team of probably 5,000 people, but we seen a ton of people come to Christ through that. And uh, in our last couple years in that business, which was 2017, 18, 19, we had a young man by the name of Taylor Seaman. And Taylor, you know, was born an atheist. He, uh, just a radical story, but is a college quarterback. And injuries, you know, led him away from football. But in that time, you know, the Lord brought him into our business and led him to Christ and uh, um, received the Lord. But we had all these different people coming in that time. And uh, Awakening started, like, in the college. It started in the schools. And, uh, you know, Taylor went on. He's an evangelist now. He, he's he got, I think, about 3 million followers on TikTok. He's nearing six, 700,000 on YouTube in the last few months. But but we've seen this movement begin, but it began in us. Then it transferred into the marketplace. And then eventually, you know, we began to help build churches. We started to build ministries. Action 169 is a ministry revolving around trafficking. And then we began in 2019 to feel the call to full-time ministry, which we were in a sense in full-time ministry before, but you know, it changes when you become a pastor Yeah. and then the church birth came and came into FCA. But, you know, it's interesting how the Lord, we many times think, you know, ministry is when we enter the pulpit, when we are pastors, but the truth is like speaking to people out there, like you are a minister of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And I think we're living in a day in America where, you know, everyone's looking to the government for solutions. Um, they're looking to their pastor for solutions. But the truth is, like, Christ is the solution. He empowers you to be a witness. And I think that's, you know, you look at our country and it says, we the people and the powers and the people. Well, the church is we the people and the power is in the hands of the church, like through Christ. Right. And it's going to take more than the pastor. It's going to take the church waking up and realizing they have authority to go pre- preach and proclaim the gospel. And that's what's going to bring change and revival to the nation is when individuals in the church realize they're equipped, they have authority, they're anointed, they can go proclaim freedom to the captives. And that's where the revival, I believe, is going to continue to begin and expand. I agree 100%. One of the, one of the questions that I have leading into the church feeling equipped and, 
and all of those different things. One, let's just go. You, you mentioned a scripture before we started, and in John 4, uh, we, we <laughs> read about this woman who has an encounter with Jesus. And she becomes, and you can explain what you were saying a minute ago, but um, she has this radical encounter. I would call it personal revival, meeting yeah. Jesus. Um, and then and then she goes from there and, and starts to proclaim the word. And I would love your perspective on that scripture. But I think sometimes uh, people, have, people have been so trained that you have to know the right thing to say. You have to know when to say it. You have to go to the right place to say it. And you have to do it with the right clothes on and you have to, you know, there's, there's all these expectations that religion would put on someone who has encountered revival with Jesus, meeting Jesus for the very first time. And then they go into a, a culture that would try to shape and mold them into what they think they should be. Um, but in reading the scripture, I don't see that at all. Yeah, man, you know that we went over it this morning. We have, we had an FCA team this morning that we were praying through this. And uh, thinking about how Jesus, you know, you know, encounters this woman at the well and uh, looking for water. And, you know, he talks to her about the living water. He says she went out thirst again, encounters her and speaks, a, you know, a prophetic word, a word of knowledge to her. And, uh, you know, talks about her five husbands. And she's like, how do you how do you know? You know, and in a sense that immediately grabs her attention and then she decides to turn from her sin as she encounters him. And I love the end of it because it says, uh. Well, it says a couple of things. It says uh, she talks about worship on the mountain and in a sense worship in the temple. But he says there's going to come a day that's coming where you're going to worship me in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden he's taken it from religion to this personal encounter and relationship with Christ. And then at the end, he's, you know, she says, I perceive you're a prophet. And when he comes to tell us these things, but he says, he goes, I who speak to you am he. So he's like, hey, I am the Christ. And from there, she goes into the city, which is really, really cool, and makes this comment. She goes, uh, let me pull it up here. Essentially, she goes to the community and tells people that, that he is the Christ. And the only thing she had to share was her encounter, that he told her things that no one else would know, and that she literally felt life come into her. And you think about that, and then she told the whole community about Christ and and many times we think that, you know, we've got to be trained, we have the right thing to say, but it was her experience, her encounter, and the radical love of Jesus that changed her, that she shared, and that began to change the change the city. Yeah, and so so her just raw encounter with Jesus. So uh, many people come to the Lord and have an <coughs> encounter with Him that would make, if in the natural, they would blush at what He pulls out of their life, Right. Uh, we've all had that encounter. The Lord reveals things in our life that uh, we wouldn't want anybody else to know. And and then out of that, she goes and says, listen, I have, I've had this revelation, this meeting with this man who is Jesus, and I want you to meet him. Um, I, think yeah. that, I think that one of the tactics of the enemy is that revival is only on a field or in a big convention yeah. center or, you know, out a lot of tent revivals that that's revival. Uh, secondly, I think that he tries to deceive the church in saying, uh, once you become, uh, once you become born again, that the gospel is always about you. But, but as you see here, the good news that Jesus brought to the woman was not even, it was about her for a moment, but as soon as she received him and, and encountered him and received him, the gospel became about everybody else. And so I think that there's some, there's some things that we have to really uh, push as, as believers in this hour, and that is uh, revival isn't just something that happens at an event. It does, and we need to gather together as believers, and, and the Lord will walk in the room totally. Um, but it's, it's the personal revival that changes your family, changes your house life, um, yeah. It's whether you meet Jesus in a big room or you meet him st sitting at your dining room table at 3.30 in the morning because he told you to, you just felt compelled to get up and go sit and, and talk to him, uh, that that's revival. But that revival doesn't ever stop with you. So you can go to an amazing event. You can, you can go to, um, you know, revival at the field in Iowa that we saw a few months ago. Uh, you can go to that event, but if it stops with you, that's, that's not a good thing. It's got to continue on. 
Yeah, you nailed it. You know, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, uh, you know, he had, they say, three to five big events in his ministry. So his three-year ministry, he's got about three to five large events. And, you know, he's feeding the, feeding the masses. But, you know, that's what those big events, in a sense, they they open our eyes. I mean, we get charged up. But then it's like we go out. And for me, the Lord has really been leading me to just disciple people one-on-one, invite them into our life again. Like we've had so many families around our table. You know, Acts 2, verses 42 through 47 talks about, you know, the, the, the teaching the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, the fellowship of one another, the selling of possessions. And that was the New Testament church. Like they were in a relationship. And then Acts 20, 20 talks about, you know, going from house to house and to the temple. Like there was a consistent gathering within the church, within houses, there's fellowship. And that's where he's really leading us. We had a, a guy last week, I work out with my worship leader and an associate pastor of our church every Wednesday morning in our garage. We got a little gym in our garage, but you know, there's a guy that called me up and he was struggling with addiction and, you know, marijuana, alcohol, and he's like 40, 41, 42 years old. And, you know, the typical Christian would say, hey, you know, come to church on Sunday, right? I mean, that's what we do. I mean, that's what we're training to do. That's what I do. Hey, come to church. We'll get everything figured out. But but what the Lord, you know, prompted me to do is, hey, invite him to work out with you guys on a Wednesday, you know? So here he comes into my garage on a Wednesday morning. We work out. He's in there. He's been sober one day, right? And uh, comes in. He gets a workout. He's sore. We begin to, you know, just converse with him afterwards. We begin to pray for him. And we're like, hey, brother, can we lay hands on you? Can we pray for you? And we, we lay hands on him in the garage and just pray for, you name it. I mean, for burdens to be removed, for the yoke to be destroyed. We pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon him. And he starts kind of just falling backwards a little bit. And uh, just gets radically encountered by Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he's just shaken. And later that day, he texts me and he goes, Mike, he goes, I've been shaken all day long. And it was, you know, the power of God coming upon him. Well, then guess where he shows up on Sunday? Yep. Church. Yep. We didn't, we didn't have to invite him. We didn't have to do anything like that. But we, we brought him into our life. You know, we ministered to him. And then he naturally comes to the fellowship. But, but that's where the church really has to get back to is inviting people into their life and uh, saying, hey, man, come hang out with me. And that's where discipleship begins. Because Jesus, you look at the 12, you know, he discipled those, those guys for three years. And, I mean, he lived with them. He hung with them. And, and it was those 12 who went on to change the nation. Well, you can't disciple at a big event. You do that in small group settings mm -hmm. and discipleship is living life with people. It's not just teaching them all the time. I mean, you live life, you eat with them, you teach them. Um, but I, that's the pattern of New Testament Christianity is, is uh, that side of it. Yeah. So and do it, doing life together is the key and uh, doing life mm -hmm. with him personally is the key. And then doing life together. Uh, if everyone is, is engaged in that and sees that as a vision of something that needs to be done, uh, revival will be sustained. Uh, because you'll have encounters like you were just describing uh, with with your new friend and and seeing him encounter the Lord. So um, moving from from the revival aspect to just uh, in this hour, can you share with me what you're seeing as a pastor on the ground in Iowa? What is the what is the temperature or what is the ground look like in Iowa for uh, ministry as a whole? Yeah, that's such a good question. You know, it's 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 pretty interesting because when COVID, I always say when COVID hit, all the idols of culture shut down, right? So every idol of culture, I mean, the sports, everything began to shut down. So so there was a window open for the preaching of the gospel where people had no choice. And the people that we were on fire, I mean, that's when our church birth, that's when our ministry began. We began to go out in the fields and that was the birthing of, of our church. And uh, what happened now, in a sense, is you know, the busyness of life, all the idols of culture are back in their emotion again. Um, so you get a sense of that, but it's changing right now. You look at the inflation, you look at the people that are nervous. Um, they're worried. You know, the, the sense of truth, like in our news networks, is very minimal. Hmm. And I think people are searching for truth. And if you're bold enough to preach the truth, um, you're going to draw people. But for me, you know, the Lord is like I mentioned he's bringing us to action two verses 42 through 47 i feel like it's the key right now and i'm going to read that real quick here but it says the vital church grows but it says with many other words he testified exhorted them be saved from this perverse generation 
So if you look at our generation that is coming up right now, I mean, it's coming in the schools I and mean, it's in the government. It's all over the place, this perverse generation, right? And he's actually saying, hey, be safe from that. Verse 41 says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. That day about 3,000 souls were added to them. <clears throat> so we've had these big movements. Now, what happened after the big event? They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, the fellowship, and the breaking of bread and prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So we've been noticing, like in our church services past week, I mean, prophetic words. We've had um, deliverance going on. We've had people, I mean, it's like the manifestation of his spirit when the word is preached is so high right now. Mm. Um, we're seeing this happen. Then it says in verse 44, now all who believed were together had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. We we have a, a farm in our church that's like, man, I feel like I'm supposed to possibly give up my farm for the ministry. So like we're seeing this kind of stuff happen. Jeremiah Johnson had a word about families buying plots of land and coming together around, you know, land. Mm -hmm. And it's the same New Testament, New Testament model. But it says, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, which for us, that's been what we're seeing is we're as a team and we're, we're inviting people into our house every week. Um, we are, I feel like the Lord, I was in the business world where my goal is always to build a bigger empire. Mm -hmm. and to build more and more, but the Lord is teaching me contentment. Like in Paul, you know, I've learned to be content with much. I've learned to be, be content with a little bit in all things I glorify Christ. Like a simplicity of heart. Like he's saying, hey, church, man, America, you guys have had it all. Um, you've done it all. Like get back to me, to the basics, get simple. Verse 47 says, praising God and having favor with all people. So you, you're living a lifestyle that regardless if they're not believers, like people are looking at you and you have favor with them. And then it says the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. So this is what we're seeing. Like we're seeing just uh, we had a event, a revival event at a farm acres here last Saturday. And uh, not a huge crowd. I think we had about 90 there. Um, but we had never been in that region before. And we had 90 people show up at a farm acreage. And we're preaching, sharing the gospel. God begins to move. And we've had those all summer long in different places in Iowa. But people are hungry, and there's like, you nailed it, where there's this underground movement. Like, if you watch the news, you don't know revival's going on. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> but if you're in the spirit and you're in Christian circles, you're like, oh, my goodness, like, God is moving all over the place. Mm -hmm. And he's not looking for stars. He's looking for servants. Um, this is going to be a different move where the common guy is like, the common guy is going to be the star, you know, just serving his neighbor. Yep. And actually, if you look across the land, the stars are actually being humbled. And when I say the stars, the stars in Christianity, um, like there's such a flipping right now where if your pursuit is fame, fortune, it's just not the ticket this day. The ticket is to serve Christ and, and live a simple, uh, simple life, not seeking the spotlight, and you'll be brought into the spotlight. Isn't that amazing? He, that's how he does it. I want to go back to one thing uh, in the scripture there in John 4, um, where it says, um, I've sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have wow. labored and you have entered into their labors. Uh, it's verse uh, 38 in John 4. I, I am humbled to sit here and talk with you and to be in this hour uh, that we live, you know, uh, for such a time as this. We quote that scripture a lot. Uh, but I truly believe that we are so blessed to be living in this hour because there's so many seeds that have been planted through all the generations through through um, great ministries and and average people sowing and you know the prayers of our grandparents and you know all that stuff and i feel i feel like we're in this hour um, we're reaping things in this hour that we didn't sow um, and Abraham planted trees he was never going to see the shade of. But um, we're living and being able to harvest fruit that we didn't labor for, that we didn't put it in the ground, that we didn't water, that we didn't do. But the harvest is so ready that if we are yeah. just focused on him, he's going to lead us into this exact place where we can harvest uh, his harvest. Well, you know, so that brings up Saturday night. We had this revival meeting at a farm and 
there was a farmer that showed up and the couple that had the meeting, they lived there two years. And the farmer was said in 1988, he was farming the field all around this acre to wrap. And the Lord spoke to him in 1988, said something amazing is going to happen at this farm. And he goes, there's going to be like a move of God here at the farm. And this was in 1988. Like I was eight years old then. Mm -hmm. So like God had a plan for this farm. And I believe there's going to be a church plan there. There's a barn there. But anyway, God had a plan for this, this piece of land back in 1988 when I was eight years old. And it really shows you, like you said, before the foundations of the world, like I knew you, mm -hmm. I created you in your inmost mother's womb. You know, I had a plan for you. I called you to be a prophet of the nations. Like, and if we submit to God and we come under his lordship, we just begin to move according to his spirit. Like he'll put us in place where he's working, mm -hmm. which is like so humbling that we get to be a part of his body. And, uh, and it's plans he said like a long time ago, but the harvest is now, like you just said. Yeah. And uh, we just get to play a part in it and reap you know, the generational prayers of many that have gone before us. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I believe that we're, we're going to see an awakening in this country, um, which has been my heart for decades, but we're going to see an awakening in this country that we've never seen before. Uh, you know, you can talk about the first great awakening in the country, the second and, and different revivals, you know, um, Brownsville and Toronto and, and all that stuff. But um, what, what I see, and maybe you can lend your, your perspective, but what I see is the average person getting lit on fire because they meet Jesus in a new way and they open up their farm or they open up their house and they say, Hey, come to my yeah. house. Um, and they're not doing it because they're looking for anything. They're doing it because they've met this person named Jesus who has revealed to them all they've ever done and has, and has given them hope and has transformed their life. And the only thing that we can do is to invite you to become a part of what we're experiencing. Amen. Amen. You nailed it. And that's what we're seeing is all across the country. There's these pockets of people rising up that are living in it. They're living in Christ, living in the spirit. And it's like a draw. Um, but it's, you know that, I mean, the past revivals would happen in one central location yep. and uh, there'd be a move of God and then everyone would go there. But it's different this time because it's happening all over. And you think about that when Christ was here the first time, you know, ministry was happening wherever he was at. But then what happened is, you know, the upper room hits and essentially his Holy Spirit falls and it goes everywhere. And he goes, hey, because what the Holy Spirit did is it allowed Christ to be everywhere within us, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of in one center location. So you look at this awakening, this revival, and it's going to be a move of the Holy Spirit where he's in each one of us. So it's an outpouring of his Holy Spirit all across the land. Mm -hmm. um, just like in Genesis 1, you know, it says he was hovering above the water. So I believe he's like. He's hovering above America, above the nations, the world, that it's going to be a movement, like you just said, that awakens the common person, and we all get to play a part in this. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, it's it's. I, I'm so excited uh, not only to document and to talk with people like you, but to, to go to different places around the country and just feel the presence of the Lord. Uh, we just got back from... Uh, from a conference for pastors in Orlando, Florida with Jesus Image and Michael Koulianos and uh, 1,500 pastors praying and, and worshiping together and the hunger in the room was so was so just tangible. And yeah. uh, and we had an encounter where, where, yeah, just the Lord showed up in, in just this peaceful yet invigorating way. And so I, I truly believe that 1,500 pastors on Sunday were in their, their home churches and, and sharing what they encountered. And uh, I believe that if we do that as leaders, um, we can have that expectation for all the people that attend our, attend our church, that when you get touched by the Lord, you can't keep it. You got you to gotta start sharing it. And, uh, and don't fall to the, to the expectation that you have to do it in a perfect way. Um, we've read the scripture already in this where uh, she just did it because she was so compelled that she met this person. And, uh, and I think that that's what we're going to see. As you said, I think it'll be houses. I think it'll be barns. I think it'll be tents. I think it'll be any kind of uh, buses, whatever. I think it'll just be everywhere that people begin to share the gospel uh, that, that Jesus came, uh, that yeah. he lived a, a life that just, uh, is a model for us, but lived a sinless life, died on the cross, uh, three days later rose again and uh, appeared to many, many people 
and then ascended to the right hand of the Father where he sat down. So we don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry about our sin. We just confess our sin and he invades our life. And, uh, and I like what you said before we ever started, you talked about dying to self and ministry and how yeah. that's a, we're dealing with people every single day, but we have to die to ourselves. And when we do that, uh, he becomes alive in our life. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We wake up dead. I think about Peter, you know, he said, when you were young, you went where you wanted to go, but when you're old, I'm going to gird you and you're going to go where I want you to go. And then he yeah. calls him to feed his, feed his sheep, you know, but it's like, so there's a piece there where, you know, he died, Peter died. Yeah. And then he went where Christ wanted to go versus where he wanted to go, you know, and, and that's, that's what we begin to do. And, and that's where you pick up your cross like Christ did. Yeah. So, so I, I just want you to take a quick moment. I want you to address the viewers of the program and, uh, and speak over them, encourage them, pray over them, whatever you decide to do to close out this episode. But um, I know there's people that are watching. If they're watching to the end, they're connected with what uh, what's being spoken here. And, uh, and I believe that you can speak into them and share with them what God's laid on your heart for them. Cool. Thank you so much for that, yeah. Pastor Rob. One quick thing before I do that. Yeah. Um, how close are you guys to Pittsburgh? We're not that far, about an hour away. Wow. Okay. So we believe we, we have an invite north of Pittsburgh. What town is it again? North of Pittsburgh, we got invited to do a one or two weekend revivals there on a, on a, there's like this big barn. Awesome. Um, this coming spring or summer. So that's, so we'll, we'll, we'll we're be looking at it. Lord willing to go on there. Yeah, we'll be a part of it and we'll put it out on the network uh, so people can come and be a part of it as well. So that's really cool. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah so uh, I, I just, I so appreciate your heart. I know that we've texted and, and we've been connected, but I believe in this hour, God is bringing connections together in the right time it wouldn't have worked five years ago but it's working now and so uh, i just encourage everybody watching if if you feel compelled to text somebody or to talk to somebody or uh you know you you just feel like you need to connect with a certain thing you can do it uh even yeah. if you don't know them we connected we didn't know each other um just over an event uh through through some friends connecting and and, uh, and now we can talk and, and have fellowship together. God is on the move. God is on the move. Yeah. And uh, my, one of my uh, mentors says, um, he had an encounter with the Lord years ago and, and the Lord said, uh, when are you gonna stop doing what you wanna do and come do what I'm doing? Uh, come along with me and, and engage with what I'm doing. And I believe that's our call as the church in this hour as leaders. Uh, let's not do what we want to do. Let's do what he's already doing. Let's get in his flow and uh, and see what he does. So if you want to become an insider uh, before Pastor Mike prays over us, if you want to become an insider with AGA, you can text the letters AGA to 330-619-4497. You get emails and, and connections from us. Uh, some of these interviews, even some of the behind the scenes things will be sent to you. Uh, directly to you. So um, it's again, it's uh, AGA to 330-619-4497. We'd love to have you as an insider to the network. So Pastor Mike, would you just go ahead and close us out here? Yeah, for sure. So Father, thank you for today. Thank you for Pastor Robin. I thank you for just uh, the AGA network. God, I, I thank you for Kingdom Connections. And I just, uh, I look at the backdrop there and it looks like a honeycomb. It looks like a, you know, bee, I think a bees, like literally coming together for a around the honeycomb and your word lord is the sweetest honey but i pray that you will connect us um in the kingdom with connections god that we can literally we can come around your word around your purposes god and we can go out into the world and proclaim your word to the nations god i pray for everyone here i pray for personal encounters i pray for just a move of the holy spirit on people where you put people in their path that need you uh, just like you encountered saul just like you encounter myself just like you've encountered Rob, God, you've encountered so many people, you know, while we're on the path to our own pursuits, God, and you encounter us and you, you awaken us and your grace and mercy, you save us, God. And I pray for each one of us to be equipped for the encounters that we can begin to see people that need you and that we have the right words at the right time. Just like Philip and the Ethiopian, he was, he was sent from the city next to the chariot and he literally had the right word at the right time that led him to salvation. He baptized him. So I pray that each of us are prepared for encounters. And I also pray for kingdom connections, God, and I pray for awakening all across the land. We pray for house fellowships to rise up. We pray for churches to be birthed. We pray for other churches to be strengthened, God, and we just pray for a move of your spirits. We just pray for the coming day 
And uh, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you did and empower us to be a witness in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Uh, Thank you all for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode on the AGA Network. 